Good Sunday night. I am Tabo Mjuli. Welcome to In Focus. Tonight, the National Prosecuting Authority has a witness protection program where people can even assume a new identity if the situation warrants it. But what about whistleblowers? Are we doing enough to protect them and encourage more people to come forward with allegations of wrongdoing? Joining us from Government Communications Information, uh, the CEO and author Temba Masego, former Trillion Financial Advisory CEO and author Silo Mutepu, and the former UCT lecturer and CEO at the Institute of Corporate and Social Ethics, Ethel Williams, and the former NPA Asset Forfeiture Unit Haid, Willie Hoffmeyer. To be a part of this conversation tonight, send your WhatsApp messages and uh, your questions and comments to 072-110-5584, or you can tweet us at at newsroom 405. Let's get into this conversation. Uh, good evening to you all and thank you very much uh, for your time today. Uh, good evening. Good evening. Uh, good evening. I'm going to start with you, Temba, as the former uh, uh, CEO of the GCIS. You're one of those who uh, went to the Commission of Inquiry, but even before that, you participated even in the process uh, when the ANC itself said uh, those with information mu must come forward and, and, and share that information. And you, you took the decision that you are going to disclose that which you know and that which you thought at the time could have either been criminal or very much close uh, to being unlawful. First and foremost, have we failed whistleblowers as a nation? All right. He's, 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 I think Temba seems to have frozen there. Uh, we'll try and, and, and get him back on that line. Uh, Musilo, let me start with you then instead as uh, Temba is, is getting back on. Have we failed whistleblowers in the country? Absolutely. We have failed whistleblowers. And we're not whistleblowers. We are conscious people. We have we are patriots. We love our country more than our paycheck. And South Africa has rejected us. Corporate has rejected us. When I, when I blew the whistle, I was betrayed by my lawyers. My, 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 my statement was leaked to the Sunday Times. I had nine criminal charges. I had 1.3 million rand of legal fees. Instead of the hawks chasing the Guptas, as now there's a, I saw on Friday, there's a Interpol criminal order. I was, I was the enemy. Temba and I spoke two weeks ago. He's been unemployed for 10 years. I was in, unemployed for three years. We are, yes, yeah, South Africa, the president, NGOs have failed us. We are alienated. We are isolated. Our livelihood, our mental health is destroyed because of the love of the country. So, did, did, did you yeah. know at the time when you made the decision to, to take this route to to, to pour out and, and publicly expose what was happening in, in corporate South Africa at the time, that this is how it will affect you? Absolutely not. Uh, your mother told you, every single person, Hindu, Muslim, Christian, atheist, when you do good, good comes to you. But there was a time in South Africa we call it nine wasted years, but there was a time when that was upside down. When you do good, bad comes to you. You are unemployed, unemployed. You have criminal charges. You are, you are unemployable. You are an enemy of the state because you fulfilled your constitutional obligation, which says if you see crime, you must report it. Tamba, you are in the public sector itself where, uh, of course, there are a lot of pol politics that uh, go on in that space at the time. But 
As a nation, when you look back, did we work hard enough to implement uh, whistleblower protection laws uh, that would, 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 would guarantee that we promote this culture uh, of public disclosure? No, unfortunately, uh, apologies for that line problem. Uh, unfortunately, I don't think the country is doing enough uh, to protect whistleblowers. And that is why, even in my case at the beginning, I, uh, I didn't want to use <laughs> the, the word whistleblower to, to, to describe myself because the stigma that was associated with, with the word, we see you as a wrongdoer. You expose your comrades, you expose fellow government people, and therefore people tend not to want to associate with you because of the stigma associated with it. So the, the law currently simply says you can't be fired for blowing your whistle, but it ends there. What needs to happen is that there needs to be firstly a culture change where people are encouraged to firstly act with absolute honesty and integrity in doing their jobs. And if they see wrongdoing, they must expose it. And in exposing them, then, then there needs to be enough mechanisms to support those who blow the whistle, who, who expose corruption. And that must include, for example, those who are being exposed must be held accountable. They must be prosecuted. They must end up with the orange overall. Secondly, if a whistleblower loses their job, there needs to be support mechanisms to make sure that they can be supported legally. For, for instance, Musila's point, where she actually had a, a huge legal bill to settle and no one was available to support her, there needs to be enough so psychosocial support because whistleblowers end up going through a phase of de depression and all kinds of social problems. They need to support to be support there. In case of a whistleblower losing their job, it's not just the whistleblower, it's their family. Their kids could be at school. They have houses to pay for, they've got cars to pay for, and therefore there needs to be some kind of financial support to make sure that we begin to encourage that culture of speaking out. But most importantly, I think in my view, we've got to make sure that those who are exposed of corruption face consequences, because that's when more and more people will start coming out to expose corruption, both in the public and the private sectors. Vili, can the whistleblowers rely on the protection afforded currently by the PDA, the South African Protected Disclosure Act? I think there's some limited uh, protection, but I don't think that it goes nearly far enough. So I, I do think that we need to think seriously about the dispensation for, for whistleblowers. And so I've got a couple of ideas that I think uh, we need to look at. And obviously the people who've experienced this probably have more ideas than I have. But I think one of the suggestions that has been made is there is a, there is a witness protection program that the NPA has. At the moment, it does not necessarily cater for whistleblowers. But I do think that that is a change that should be made. I think that the mandate of that program should change so that where it's necessary, um, whistleblowers can go onto the witness protection program. The advantage of the program is, I mean, it is a drastic program in a sense that you disappear out of the lives of all the people that you knew. Well, that can cater for families and so on, but the uh, advantages are that they do have the instruments in the program, for example, to help people assume a new identity if they need to do that. Um, whistleblowers have even been hidden in foreign countries where that's uh, been necessary. Yeah. So I think for me, that's, that's the one issue. Um, I also agree with the, the proposal that we actually should provide a financial incentive for whistleblowers. Um, I think from the people that I've engaged with, they've all had drastic financial consequences in their lives. And whether it's a joint fund set up between the private sector and, and the state, but I, I do think that that is something that we, that we really should fight for is real and proper support for, for whistleblowers. There is also the, there is quite a lot of money in the criminal asset recovery account that, 
which is where the asset forfeiture unit pays the money in which it recovers. But there's, a, I think, well over 100 million rand there, for instance. So I think there is also money in the state yes. that I think could be used to, to support a proper program for whistleblowers. And uh, 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 before we, we, we get to the second portion of this, Athol, I just want to bring you in as well so we can have your view in, in this opening as an opening remark. Have we given full consideration uh, to, to the experience uh, uh, of whistleblowers in the country to, to the point where we, we, we actually close the gaps, which uh, I suppose have been highlighted now by Musilo, by Temba, as well as uh, Vili Hoffman? I don't think so at all, Tabu. I mean, I, you know, I would have ended this discussion after Masila's opening remarks because I think she captured the essence of it. Um, I'm yet to encounter any organization within government, the NGO sector or the private sector who actually is willing to do something about this. So I've had, as, as I'm sure the other whistleblowers have, countless interviews, newspaper articles, discussions about this, and it seems no one is really interested in doing anything. No one with the power to do something. All the rest of us are waving our hands around. But it, for me, it's inconceivable that we can be in this position where even someone like Bianca Goodson, who has done an amazing service to our country, is now launching a backer buddy program to raise money to, to sustain herself. We as a country are failing real people morally by not acting up. And for me, this, this issue of being a whistleblower isn't in the past tense. I don't think it ever goes away. But I'm currently in the situation with UCT where they are consciously trying to discredit me. And again, I, 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 I look around to see where the support is, where the help is, and there's none. So we, we seem to be at, at some <coughs> apathy where... Um, we, we are not interested in addressing this issue. But let me tell you what I think why. Because whenever someone says to me, Athol, should whistleblowers be protected? I always push them to ask, protected from whom? Who do you want us to be protected from? Because once we identify the person who I should be protected from, then we can go and tackle them, right? Well, the problem is no one's interested in tackling those companies or institutions. So everyone know UCT is currently persecuting me, but not a single organization, even media house, is willing to tackle them. So we, I call this pain porn. We love the hearing about whistleblowers' pain, but no one is willing to stand up, raise their voice, and actually do something about it. We'll continue in a moment. Obviously, a full arsenal of acts of victimization is what we're going to be hearing more of when we continue. And I want to put the question to Masilo in a moment. Is it worth pursuing uh, recourse, uh, considering the, the level of victimization that she has gone through, uh, particularly going the legal route? Temba Masego, Masilo Mutepu, Apple Williams and Billy of Mayor with us tonight. You're a part of this conversation. We ask you the question, should whistleblowers be financially incentivized? but also guaranteed security in this country to show indeed that we are serious and we, we, we take the decisions that they have taken for public good seriously. 072-110-5584, tweet us at Newsroom 405. We're back in a moment with your In Focus. on In Focus tonight. News in Africa, Channel 405. What you're reading there, a tweet from Mendy Wiener, mentioned by Apple Williams uh, before we went to the break uh, moments ago. That is a tweet uh, for former Trillion exec Bianca Goodson, who blew the whistle, and her actions resulted in 1.6 billion rands being returned to South Africa. Goodson uh, can't find a job, is broke, has um, post-traumatic stress disorder, and has had to sell her home. She's asking for help. Please consider uh, contributing this is the lived reality of whistleblowers uh, in the country. Musila said before the break, considering that there is this full arsenal of acts of victimization that can be meted out by powerful institutions against whistleblowers, is it worth pursuing recourse, uh, the legal route?
I saw I saw Bianca's message. And I think maybe that's South Africa has to see the tears of whistleblowers. How can Bianca have to sell her our house? How can Temba not work for 10 years? How can I not work? How can we be unemployable? Mr. President, South Africans, we are not whistleblowers. We are heroes, we are patriots. I, we decided to say no to corruption. No to state capture. And you treat us like lepers. You shun us, you isolate us. We are unemployable. We have to sell our assets. We lose our homes, we get divorced. We, we suffer from depression, uh, post-traumatic disorder, anxiety, insomnia, in the name of saying no to corruption. How can Bianca Goodson have to sell her house? <clears throat> and I'm saying to South Africa now, shame on you, all of you, shame on all of you. We fought for this country. How can you not support us? How can we be unemployable? Every single corporate entity, every government department, the ethos is integrity. But when we see that we said no to, to corruption, you turn us away. I have been in Bianca's situation, but luckily uh, Rob, Rob Shooter at MTN gave me a job for two years. And now I'm working, even though the salary is my, is, is, is my salary that I earned five years, it, it, it puts bread on the table. It's a travesty. I, I, I don't know, Tamba, Ethel, we have been saying and repeating the same story. South Africa is not hearing us. Yeah. The lawyers are not hearing us. The president, Cyril Matamela, Kamapos, Ndadekagupa, help us. We put our lives on the line to say no to three brothers from India, and you are paying us back with bankruptcy and depression. Yeah. Tamba, will that, whistleblowing as, as, as a tool emerge bruised and, and, and burnished in the wake of exactly what Musilo is saying right now, but in the wake of what you yourself have experienced uh, on, on, on public platforms, on social media, uh, people who are questioning your actions, uh, but people who are also saying uh, your disclosure would need to be proven to be true before the country must even have reason to believe that it is fact. Temba, I don't know if you, got, you could hear me there. All right, I think we seem to have uh, lost Temba there on that line. Ethel, I mean, that is the, the, the question, isn't it? Uh, many are saying, even with yourself, having been at the Commission of Inquiry into State Capture, that what you mentioned there, that disclosure would need to be proven to be true before the country can have reason to believe what you say. I, I can understand that people would want to question uh, what whistleblowers reveal. I think that's reasonable. Um, I think the Zonda Commission has a process where it invites those implicated, or anyone in fact, to cross-examine whistleblowers. Uh, as you know, from my testimony, not a single person implicated in my, my testimony uh, came forward to, to cross-examine me.
Um, so for me, that shows that my testimony must stand. So there can be no reasonable questioning about what I, what I testified to, Tabu, because no one has challenged it. Um, we've, all I've had is, is personal attacks. We've had Mr. Tom Ayani calling me um, derogatory names. Um, we've had Bain and company trying to get my testimony, uh, my affidavit redacted and having my, and my testimony thrown out, or again, personal attacks on me. So it seems like we present ourselves for public ridicule and an attack um, without any reasonable challenge to what we, what we present. Um, and, and again, we must suffer the burden of that. Um, Tabu, I'd like you to, I'd like you to answer a question for us. I mean, this is a panel, right? This is an interview. How do you respond as someone not involved as a whistleblower to what Masilo is saying? We can't just skirt over Masilo's pain that she's expressing. Yeah. Um, what, what is your view of this? Are, are we my, just my, all my, my, cases? My, my, my view, uh, 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 Ethel, would be that this is why I'm having this conversation, because I do feel that whistleblowing will suffer a bruise uh, and whistleblowing will be will be banished coming out of the recent events that we are seeing and uh, the obvious glaring gaps that have been exposed hence the question should whistleblowers be financially incentivized because clearly that is a gap that is being exposed uh, through the the lived experience of all of you today but secondly uh, even more uh, worrying is the fact that there is uh, a, a threat, a physical threat to the security of not only the whistleblower but the family as well and everybody else that is, is associated with them because these people even get to a point, some of them become assassinated actually, uh, they, don't, they don't make it uh, through. So it's something that certainly would other need to be looked at closely and as, as uh, Vili says, some amendments need to be done to the current laws but something certainly has, has, has got to be done. And that is, that, is, that, is, that is my view and the reason for, for having this conversation. But, of course, we've got to cover all, all the views that are out there and, and what it really means to, to somebody else who's, who's watching your testimony or, or listening to your story. And they are questioning why, for example, did you choose to, 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 to go public? Did you ever think of seeking uh, uh, protection from within your, your employment environment? Well, well, no. I mean, I my, my employment environment is is the place where it's pushed me out. I mean, UCT, you know, suggested. I mean, using the word suggested in quotes, suggested that I resign. Um, the, this is this point I'm making about this. We don't need protection from some unknown ghost. Um, we know who the perpetrators are, right? So we know it's UCT in my case. We know it's Bain in my case. We know who the perpetrators are. Like Masilo saying, Atemba saying, we know where they are. So we don't need, don't come protect me. Go and stop those who are persecuting us. Um, I will need protection if we, can, if we can stop those who are persecuting us. And that's what I'm saying we seem to be afraid of. Um, no one's wanted to call out Bain or UCT or the people and companies who are protecting them. Um, I want that to be the focus. And, and I know it's one of the recommendations we made in our submission to the Zonda Commission um, in terms of changes to the PDA. We've got to prosecute those organizations who are persecuting whistleblowers. We mustn't talk in generality, Stabu. We must be very specific here because we know who the perpetrators are. We continue in a moment with our panel. Temba Masego, Musilo Mutepu, Ethel Williams, and Billy Hoffmeyer. You're part of the conversation. What's up? Your questions and comments. 072-110-5584. You can tweet us at newsroom405. In focus, continues next. You're live on In Focus tonight, and we continue in our conversation looking at the whistleblower environment in South Africa. The question we ask, does it make for a proactive and considered uh, public disclosure? And should whistleblowers uh, be given financial incentives as well as guaranteed security in order to promote a culture in the country uh, of doing good and those who want to expose those things that uh, are clearly uh, going wrong within the private as well as the public sector. Temba Masego, Masilo Mutepu, Ethel Williams, and Vili Hoffmeyer with us uh, tonight. Vili, before the break, I see you had your hand up. Uh, you can uh, absolutely come in here. Give us what you, what you were thinking. I mean, I think that <clears throat> what is important and what comes very clearly out of the discussion is that there is no entity in South Africa whose responsibility it is 
to assist whistleblowers with all the many challenges that they face. And, you know, so I think that's for me a starting point. I think we do need an entity, um, frankly. Um, my choice would be that such an entity should probably be headed by a retired constitutional court judge or somebody whose credibility and honesty is absolutely above reproach. But it should then have the mandate. It should have a budget so that it can deal with whistleblowers, it can relocate them, it can take them overseas if they need to go overseas. But I think it needs the capacity to be able to provide the kind of assistance that we're talking about here. Because that for me is the main problem at the moment. It's nobody's responsibility to deal with whistleblowers and assist them. And I think the terrible stories that we hear about here is testimony to that, yeah. to the lack of funding, to the lack of action by government. And you know, so I'm not saying I've got the final answer here, but yeah. I do, having worked in the state for many years, I just know that if it's not somebody's job to assist and work with whistleblowers, it's nobody's job at the end of the day. And that puts us back where we are at the moment. Where does the one so point, me, where, where does the 1.6 billion rands recovered uh, through the information given by the whistleblower actually go and 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 uh, do they just take the money and say thank you and and forget completely about uh, the kind of price that you pay for the whistleblowing? That 1.6 billion rand that I had to write an affidavit for, along with Bianca Goodson. And I had to write a confirmatory affidavit to the, the former CEO and the former chairperson because they were not there. We got not a thank you. We didn't get anything, just a judgment that yes, Trillion, there was a corrupt relationship between Trillion and Eskom. And Trillion has to pay back just under 700 million. Mackenzie paid back over a billion with interest. And I would just like to continue with uh, Veli's uh, um, uh, states. The, the legislation in South Africa is, apologies, it's, it's a Labor Act, it's the Protected Disclosure Act. It says, if you disclose corruption, you cannot be suspended or fired. That's, that's all it says. But then once you are suspended or fired, you have to fight like I did with Trillion when I took them to the CCMA. I had to fight with my own money. My 1.3 million rand bill. Trillion fought with South Africa taxpayers' money. So it's it's not enough. We have to, I, 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 when I was at the Zondo Commission and, I, and I've, I've met somebody from the FBI who knows somebody who wrote the legislation of America on whistleblower legislation about the reward, the protection, physical protection, the legislative protection, and the institution of how do we support whistleblowers. We are, I, I, I didn't expose corruption because I wanted to be rewarded. I, I exposed it because I was raised by my mother in the right way. But in terms of what Billy said about the uh, the, 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 the witness protection program. The, the, the witness protection program. State capture was a state organized design machinery. I had nine criminal charges because I blew the whistle. Yeah. 
the hawks were after me. Yeah. They let the Guptas go to Dubai. Salim Issa. Apparently, he has lunch every day, 32,000 rand with our money. Mm. I can't trust the state to protect me yeah. because state capture was something that the state designed, yeah. implemented. And those who said no, yeah. they persecuted them. Yeah. I am now, that 1.3 million rand is paid by, I, I am protected by PLUS. PLUS is, is in Paris. They are an international NGO. They, 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 they support uh, Edward Snowden, mm. Julian Assange, the, the, the former banker of Joseph Kabila. He mm. had to leave and he's now <coughs> in Paris. Mm. No South African firm yeah. person supported me. Right. And only when I became famous, everybody wanted to support me. Yeah. And I said, no, PLUS is my entity. But there are other whistleblowers who are not so famous, who yeah. don't get their statements on the on 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 um, and, Sunday and, time. And, and, and do you, and do you think those whistleblowers should be protected from civil, criminal, or even administrative liability? I mean, considering the type of charges you're saying nine that you had to face uh, uh, in this particular case, where you were doing something that you thought it was a disclosure in public interest, and as you're saying, because you were raised right. My charges were ridiculous. Cybercrime. Because I forwarded my email to my Gmail account, and I gave them to Tuluma Doncel. Ex attempted extortion. I don't know what that means. Conspiracy. Because I, my lawyers were advertisement, they thought that somebody was funding me, so I, I was I, I conspired. Corruption, theft, contravention of my confidentiality clause, perjury. And when when the hogs called me, they said, because of the political situation and because of how the how trillion was politically connected they had to expedite mm. my case mm. yeah. yeah yeah i don't i'm not going to wait for yeah honorable deputy judge president zondo to declare whether there was state capture yeah i have lived it for i'm 43 years old yeah from 38, I have seen ESCOM. I've seen Danelle. I've seen SAA. I've seen SA Express. I've seen Transnet mm. being looted. And I said, I love my country. Yeah. Ethel said he loves his country. Yeah. SARS. Then there was this conspiracy of the rogue unit and Ivan Pele and, and Yoli Piki, they, their lives have been destroyed because yeah. they were going after the, the tobacco tax evaders. I, I'm going to come back to you, Musila, in a moment. Temba, I just want you to, 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 to jump in here as well. I mean, do you think that whistleblowing is going to be the the victim here, I suppose, will suffer because of these events uh, that we are talking about that uh, Masilo, um, Athol and yourself have gone through and many others who decided to, to take this route of actually uh, disclosing in public interest. Chabot, does it, but I think the good point to come back to the conversation, apologies for the break in transmission. The first thing is that I think the sea change that I'm seeing is the fact that as a nation, we're talking about this matter. Uh, because in the past, this is something that whistleblowers have been suffering with in silence, with nobody knowing about it. So the fact that we're talking about it, we're raising the level of awareness, I think that's important. But 
we have to, in writing my book, one of the difficulties I had was the extent to which if you talk about these things openly, the risk of scaring other people who are in the system, who know information about corruption, who may view this as a, as a, as a, a very scary conversation to say, I don't want to go through what Temba went through or Musilo went through or what Arthur is going through. So I think that's the risk, but I think it's an important conversation and I'm glad we're having it. We also need to understand that there are different degrees of uh, whistleblowers that exist out there. The ones we're talking about tonight are the big powerful politicians, big companies, your powerful wealthy Gupta families who have stolen money from you and I. And those tend to have the, the resources to actually take a Mozilla to court and make all these kinds of things. But when we're talking about a culture change, about whistleblowing, we need to drill it down to all levels so that when a secretary is sitting in an office of a CEO or a, a DG or a minister, a deputy minister, sees wrongdoing, they see it as their responsibility and duty to expose it and speak out. Because that's when we're gonna, because this is not just about whistleblowing, it's about beginning a culture of reversing corruption that is getting so rooted in every aspect of our society. So we need to change that culture and getting people to speak out. And in speaking out then, all of these mechanisms we're talking about, making sure that there's some kind of financial support, psychosocial support, because a lot of the whistleblowers go through serious periods of depression. They need support, legal support. Some need security. Not every whistleblower will need a security guard, et cetera, et cetera. And that's when I wanted to come in when Billy was speaking, because I think when we start talking about the witness protection program, I think we're taking it to a slightly different level because whistleblowers are a different category as opposed to a witness. Yeah. So when you start creating an impression that we need to, a witness protection program, so a whistleblower start thinking who's somebody sitting in government or some corporate office that's experiencing corruption. When they start thinking that they're gonna be uprooted from their family, taken to a circuit house, possibly taken out of the country, then we're actually creating an environment of fear and many people will be, very few people will be willing to speak up. So we need to make it something that ordinary South Africans do. And if they do, they know that they will be protected. They will not lose their jobs. If they lose their job, they'll get financial support to fight the, the, the dismissal that they're encountering either from government or from, from the pri private sector. So in my view, the starting point is just to begin to build a culture in our society as a whole, not just in government, private society, but in society in general, right. for saying to our children, our youth, when you see wrongdoing everywhere you see it, report it. And that's when we start fighting corruption because this is not just an abstract conversation about yeah. whistleblowing. Yeah. It's yeah. at the end of the day about fighting corruption, corruption. in all its manifestations, Tell from the municipality to the province to national government to if there's a president involved in it, people must speak out. And that's the culture that we need to see. All right, we'll continue with you in a moment. Temba Masego, Musilo Mutebu, Ethel Williams, and Billy Hoffmeyer. Let's look at some of the reaction tonight so far on Twitter. This one uh, is from Heman Mashaba saying, South Africa, shame on all of you. Musilo Mutebu, I agree with your sentiments. Mabule Rapela saying, it's so sad that 10 years later, with so much experience, uh, Temba Masego is still unemployed, having been the first to blow the whistle on the Guptas. Paul, uh, uh, there on Twitter saying, I, I, read, both, I read both books of Temba and Musilo, uh, very horrific tales experienced by them. I think there should be affordable, uh, afforded protection and remuneration uh, during and after the expose. Uh, Kim saying, no one will blow any whistle knowing that they will be the ones left at the receiving end, more so than the crim criminals they reported. Lita saying, whistleblower, uh, on at Newsroom 40, how can they suffer whilst they stood up, whilst it was unfavorable to do so? So South Africa rewards looters and punishes men and women of integrity. Reaction so far tonight uh, on Twitter. Let us know your views on WhatsApp 072-110-5584 on Twitter as well at Newsroom 405. We'll continue in a moment.
Now to that on News from Africa Channel 405. It's in focus in conversation with Temba Masego, Musida Mutepu, Ethel Williams, and Vili Hofmeyer. Taking your views and thoughts tonight, 072-110-584. The whistleblower environment in the country. Looking at the rewards and protections of whistleblowers. Does it make for an environment for proactive and considered public disclosure? Let us know what your views are today. Ethel, before the break, I was asking the question, should whistleblowers be protected from civil and criminal and even administrative liability uh, for the legitimate public disclosures that they're making? I think there's, there's two aspects to consider their taboo. One is protection and the other one is support. And I think those, those, those do come apart slightly. I think in terms of support, um, whistleblowers need access to information, they need access to know what their rights are and what risks they're facing. Um, I think every whistleblower will say they uh, were they completely underestimated the, the risks they were going to face um, from blowing the whistle. So I think there's, there's an information um, um, deficit as well where people keen to blow the whistle need access to this information so they can make an informed decision about it and also know what they're in for. I think that separately is this idea of protection. It says once you've done it, once you've actually blown the whistle, how do we protect you? And I, I do think we need, to, we need some way of filtering and triaging the genuine whistleblowers. And I think that's a different, d difficult task. And so it you know, really is a proposal of having a, a retired constitutional judge. Um, I think someone with legal expertise is important here. Because there's, there's, a, there's a risk that you know, criminals begin um, you know, um, getting their way into this process of kind of calling themselves whistleblowers and so come under this protection. So I don't think it's a blanket protection. I think it's some way of assessing the, the authenticity of the whistleblower and his or her testimony. I think once it is shown that there are genuine whistleblowers, that what they are disclosing is in public interest, then I think they do require very firm, very strong protection from, um, from um, lawsuits, from being sued, and then actively having those who are persecuting them uh, being, being prevented, and in fact punished for, for then attacking whistleblowers. Yeah. Tabo, can I come in here? Yes, um, please. I think there's a salient part of your question that needs uh, a bit of consideration. One is the fact that there are different levels and types of whistleblowers. So if somebody is part of criminal activity, for example, and benefits from that criminal that theft from a company or private se public sector, and then later on decides to be a whistleblower. Now, the kind of protection, I think we need to talk about it because the, person, the fact that the person participated in, in acts of criminality themselves and then subsequently becomes a whistleblower, I don't think they should be completely exonerated from the wrongdoing that they did. Yes, the exposure they then do through whistleblowing must be welcome and supported, and to that extent they must be protected. But to the extent that they also participated in criminal activity and benefited from, I think there's some level of accountability that they themselves need to be held accountable for if they indeed participated in for example, state capture, and subsequently decided to expose the corruption that they themselves were involved in. So I think that's a salient point that we, yeah. we really need to apply our minds to. Thank you in for terms of, I, I, I thank you for raising, because I, I think Tuluma Donsela, who was the, the author of the state of capture, she wrote an article, I, I think last year, about possibly giving leniency to the to the the smaller criminals who may be paid under duress. And, and I, 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 I struggled with that because maybe I'm an a, a sharp personality. I'm wearing black and white. If there's black and white, you are either a criminal or you're not. So in as much as yes, there were people who, like, you know, I think one, one character comes to mind is uh, Busasa, Agrizi. He benefited in, in the corruption. He, 
he almost died because he had a heart condition and then he became a whistleblower. Me and you, we didn't benefit. We got our salary, and we, but we said no. And we, we said, we're going to go to the public protector or you went to, your, to the ANC's organization or which other avenues you, you went to. But at the end of the day, I believe that you steal a cent or you steal a trillion or somebody said to you under duress, and an unlawful instruction is not an excuse for you to say, I was following orders. Yeah. I am very, very, I think because we have suffered so much for saying no. So I, I don't want any leniency for anybody. Right. This country has, we had liberation and then 27 years later, three Indian brothers looted our economy. And those liberators persecuted us because we said no. Mm. Really, a study was done already in 2016 called Heroes Under Fire. And these issues that you're raising, the seven gaps that currently exist in the, in the PDA were highlighted. Why have the amendments not been considered? Oh, so that's a, a difficult question to answer. But I suspect we are dealing, or were dealing at least, hopefully not anymore, with the lack of political will to make those kind of amendments. And I do think that is, I hope something that will come out of this program is that there will be a lot more pressure to fix the legal frameworks here. Um, you know, just on, on the, the point that was raised, I think, by Tuli Madoncella at one stage about some sort of amnesty for people who come forward to give information. I don't think our constitution allows amnesty in that kind of way. The only amnesty it allowed for was in terms of the TRC. But I, the point I want to make is that I think a lot of the serious corruption happens in a very organized way. It is not one person's doing. It's very often a group of people. Usually it's a group of people. And when you're dealing with a group of people, you're talking about organized crime, essentially. When you want to prosecute organized crime, you very often need somebody who was on the inside who you can turn into a state witness and it would be willing to give evidence for the state. That's the Agritzi kind of scenario to some degree. So I think there is room for that. I think that is important if we're going to deal with the depth of corruption in our country, not just pick up the people who get caught doing the work. You need to get to the people who sponsor them who instruct them very often to do the bad things. And, I, you know, so I think in that sense, you cannot just prosecute everybody. You do need to try and focus on the people who are the real organizers of the looting of the state. Right. If we don't get to them, we're not going to stop the looting. Ethel, let me give you a final word here, just your final thoughts as we wrap up the conversation. Um, Toby, you had mentioned earlier this idea of compensating whistleblowers, and, and I guess um, we, we can separate rewarding whistleblowing from compensating whistleblowers. In my mind, at a minimum, we need to make whistleblowers as, as well off, as good as they were, make them whole effectively um, before they, they blew the whistle. So you look at what they were earning, yeah. what the economic status was, what their, what their debts were, um, and, and somehow make them whole. Whether we then want to reward on top of that is a separate issue. But at a minimum, it's got to be making them whole. I appreciate all of you for coming through tonight. Temba Masego, Musio Mutepu, Apple Williams, and Vili Hofmeyer, and for you for being a part of this conversation tonight at Newsroom 405. Also on WhatsApp, 072 110 When we continue next, growing calls 
for Health Minister Dr. Zwilin Kizer uh, to step down from his position. We'll speak to Naledi Chira, Member of Parliament for the Economic Freedom Fighters. Stay with us.